happens? This side Rahul Magan here is a group chief executive officer treasury consulting and also a venture capitalist. Today we are going to shoot about another interesting video about the reg tech which is regulatory technologies whereby we are going to, show, we are going to shooting about fundamental view of the trading book the market risk. Actually what are we covering we in this video which is predominantly 35 to 40 minutes video we are going to be covering a lot of aspects of fundamental review of the trading book and we would be especially covering about the market risk aspect of the fundamental review of the trading book. So in that regard I have made up a case but before starting of this video I would like to indemnify that the names of the banks, financial institutions and the corporates which are used in this is just for the sake of example. It has nothing to do in the real life resemblance and in case in real life any resemblance takes place this is just in coincidence. So treasury consulting is taking complete indemnification it is not it's not a realistic scene it is just a, for the sake of example. So we have made a case on the fundamental review of the trading book but before this case let me tell you something very holistically about FRTP. We know that fundamental review of the trading book is coming in 2022 so, so actually it has to start from 1st January 2019 but unfortunately due to the resistance by few top banks who hold the muscle power it's now being postponed to 1st January 2022. While fundamental review of the trading book is talking too many things but ultimately the basic premise of the fundamental review of the trading book is that the, the transfers between the banking book and the, and the trading book should not happen. Ideally speaking the Volkers after 2008 two laws got a lot of attention worldwide. One is the Volker and one is the Dodd-Frank. While Dodd-Frank got an attention because of the DFST, Dodd-Frank stress testing well, I am fully against that DFST because I think that DFST can easily be manipulated and even from 2008 till 2019 which is precisely 12 years I have never saw that DFST every year the big banks of the globe based upon certain quantitative parameters are going to be half stress test but I have never seen that this stress test at the end of the day resulted with any uh, benefit to the final customer or to the final investor. But nonetheless, second is the Volkers. Volkers follow was of opinion that the banks are maintaining the two set of books. One is the investment banking book and one is the banking book. Volker was of opinion that the transfers between the investment banking and the banking book should not happen. Well, I am not much in sync with the Volker and I think that today the, the, today the basic premise of Volker is not there. The reason being, I don't know how many of you people are actually spending one hour in a day reading magazines, international magazines, international newspapers and updating themselves. If yes, you would have get to know that investment banking which used to juice, juice, right? 10% of the revenue of the top banks of the globe like Goldman, Chase, Standard Chartered City and all, now it is juicing less than 3% of the revenue. So practically speaking Goldman which used to assume used to earn $100 the investment banking used to have $10 of revenue and now it is less than $3. So Volcker do not have much premise today but still for the sake of the law people are getting it carried. Fundamental review of the trading book is one level higher than Volcker. So fundamental review of the trading book is actually copying a lot of, lot of stuff from Basel 3 and apart from that at the same time the basic premise is that the transfer between the banking book and trading book do not happen. You know that I am an I am a ex corporate treasurer of an American entity. I always see the regulation from the bank angles because I am always of the premise that majority of the regulators are either passed out from the E League business schools, which is Oxford, Stanford, Calic, and all, and they have realistically never worked in the bank. They do not know the problems of the bank. They just passed out from a B school wherein you have an air conditioner room and you have the big titles like Stanford, Calic and all and you not even, even you do not know how the Reuters and Bloomberg work. So you made some laws which practically operationally is not possible. And if you get some time, my Singapore trip is starting from 19th of June which will go till, till for next 26 days and I'll try and shoot a very good video about the operational risk of the bank from Singapore. Multiple videos on the cards from Singapore. Please be rest assured. In today's case, when it comes to the 
market risk, I have made a specified case. And that case is a realistic case. So using this case, I would like to uh, uh, basically highlight the issue that how that it's not very easy. It's easier said than done that the trading book, that the transfer between the banking and the trading book can be stopped. And here is the case. Now, the corporate which I have taken is the Singtel. Singtel is nothing but the Vodafone of Singapore, right? Sing, the bank I have taken is the Goldman Singapore, right? They both need no introduction. The principal bank I have taken is the principal of Goldman Singapore is of course Goldman US, right? Currency I have taken US dollar. The period I have taken 10 years. The type of the product is trade finance product which is standby letter of credit. Now in this standby letter of credit, I am in writing in bracket that it is with credit line. I repeat, I am writing in bracket that it is with credit line. And then I am writing the interbank. The interbank partner of Goldman, uh, Goldman US are Credit Suisse, Chase and UPS. I will take a pause here. You must be thinking that why do we need the interbank partner? We need interbank partner. Since this side is not very long, so the interbank partner we kept it here. Now, of course, we let you know that how the interbank partner works and all. Now, the interbank partner which we assume is the Credit Suisse, JP Morgan Chase, ANZ Sydney, Westpac London, DBS Singapore, UOB Malaysia, HSBC Commonwealth, Deutsche London, SCB Singapore, UBS, NAB, NAB stands for National Australian Bank, and Emirates. 44 plus means total 44 interbank top banks of the globe are the Goldman has interbank partner and that is realistic also. Goldman is the only bank of the globe which is standing at 40 trillion dollars of derivative book while the another banks like DBS, UOB and a lot of banks they even dare to reach to that level of position. I doubt. I think we need to add more than 20 banks in the top top 20 banks of the globe to reach to the total derivative position of the Goldman. And to reach that derivative position, Goldman not only requires the high skill set, the proprietary engines, but also require the interbank partners. And that is one of the reasons we have taken the case of the Goldman to make this case a lot holistic. But this is not a, but resemblance in the real life is just a coincidence. So these are all the interbank partners for Goldman. These interbank partners total cumulatively have given the credit line, which you can see here, the credit line of 10 trillion dollars to Goldman. So the total credit line sanctioned to Goldman by these 44 uh, their interbank partners is the 10 trillion dollars while the total utilized total utilized line is the 4 trillion dollars. The rest mathematics is relatively very easy that if the total is 10 trillion dollars minus 4 the 10th amount to the 6 trillion dollar. The cost of these lines which Goldman got from their interbank partners is the floating lines, floating pricing, floating lines and we are not here uh, discussing in detail that how these floating lines works, it is subject to consultancy charges. In short, to get back that we are having a case where in Singtel Singapore, which is the Vodafone of uh, Singapore, is, is basically contacting the Goldman Singapore and asking that I need 10 billion dollar of standby. Now Goldman is asking why do you need 10 dollar of standby? They are saying we need this for the working capital requirement which we are doing as a group. Dot by word which we are doing as a group. So they are asking for the 10 years standby with credit line. Now standby is of two types. One is the orthodox taxonomy which is the least standby. One is the non least standby. Another standby of the taxonomy is the credit line based standby and non credit line based standby. We are not entering into that discussion that how the pricing of credit line and non credit line happening that is relatively a consultancy part so that we are not coming in the public domain. The interbank partner for Goldman are these the complete details of the interbank partner are here while the total line sanction is the 10 trillion utilize is 4 trillion and balance is 6 trillion and whatever being sanctioned it is sanctioned on the floating prices. Now the game starts here. The notional is 10 billion dollars while the pricing is happening at the dollar L. I have already told number of times in my video that do not mention L. 
L is a wrong word. Mention dollar L. Dollar L means the dollar pricing of it. Plus 100 basis point. This 100 basis point is the QST. QST stands for quality spread differential. C fees means commitment fees. I hope people, few people here, those who are watching this video would know that SPLC or any trade finance product is subject to two type of fees. One is the utilization fees and one is the commitment fees. Now here we are talking about the commitment fees which is 0.25% of the notional. And then we have hedging. Yes, why do we have hedging? Because the standby is given in the dollar terms. While the functional currency of the Singtel is Sing dollar. I repeat, Singtel Singapore will consolidate the books. Will need this money at the group level. So say Singtel do have a lot of operations. But Singtel need this money at the group level. So, but the consolidation wise, their functional currency is Sing dollar. While the funding which they are taking is the US dollar. So that is the question. So hedging is required. CDS, of course, required. Because what would if Singtel defaults? And unfortunately, if you go to Singapore, not going to, there's no need to go to Singapore for that. You visit any website and you will see that, unfortunately, Singtel financial condition is not Real, in real life also, the Singtel financial condition is actually not as good as it should be. It's very easy to say that it is Vodafone of Singapore, but the financial condition and the share price of the Singtel is actually not what it should be, which is a cause of which should be the cause of concern for Singapore, Singapore government and also for Singtel as well. But that is something which we are not discussing. Is that SPLC is having rolling price is rolling after 10 years? Sorry, rolling after what? Uh, yes, 10 years. Of course, yes, TAT. TAT stands for turnaround time that today, which is 16 June 2018, if, if uh, Singtel will ask for any amount out of $10 billion that that uh, GS Singapore, Goldman Singapore is entitled to give them whatever money they ask, but the limit is 10 billion dollars. I repeat, the deal is of 10 years, it's a rolling, so that after 10 years it would automatically roll, basically after uh, every year it would roll for uh, for rest 10 years, but the TAT is T plus 2, so GS require 48 hours, TAT actually varies, so in some cases TAT is T plus 1, in some cases it is T, in some cases T plus 2, in some cases T plus 5, in some cases I have saw it is T plus 7 also and I don't know how many people here know how the pricing happens but TAT is always having a direct proportion to the not only the pricing but the commitment fees. The higher the TAT you add more basis point into the fees the lower the TAT sorry the higher the TAT you need to reduce the basis point from the fees the lower the TAT the few basis point would be added which is a compensation to the gold mine. So here if the tag would have been 0, then I would have added maybe 5 bips more. So it is 0 0.3 or maybe 5 bips here, which is dollar $L plus 105 basis point. Now the real seeds start, start in FRTB. Now how it happens, now we will discuss that whether it would be easy for the banks, which is big banks like GS, to able to transfer from banking book to trading book. Let's see. Singtel Singapore got the line from GS Singapore. No problem. These lines are backed up by the principal bank. And who is the principal bank for Goldman? It's the Goldman US. Of course, Goldman, Goldman Singapore principal bank would never be UBS. Not at all. So Goldman U, uh, Singapore principal bank would be Goldman US. And they have the balance sheet in dollar terms. These are all the interbank partners for them. And the total sanction line is the 10 trillion dollars for them. So out of 10 trillion dollars, if they have a customer which is Singtel Singapore, who is asking for 10 billion dollars, then it's a relatively very small amount. We just need to have a calculation because 1 trillion dollar is 1000 billion. 1 trillion dollar is 1000 billion. So ultimately it is 10,000 billion. Out of 10,000 billion, the Singtel is asking only for 10 billion. So realistically speaking, if you have $10,000 and somebody asking only $10, so money-wise is not a problem for Goldman to give to uh, Singtel. But actually the problem is not the money. The problem is the hedging and also that how you could quantify in the banking book and the trading book. The problem is that 
Singtel, first, it's a rolling product, which means today, if I'm going to take this today, then it is 18th June, sorry, uh, 16th June 2018 till 15th June 2029. Uh, I repeat, 16th June 2008, uh, 2019 to 15th June 2029. Tomorrow, when it would be 17th June, it would be 17th June 2019 till 16th June 2000 and uh, 2029. So this rolling would continue and this rolling would surely create an impact in the books of the Goldman, not only the local subsidiary which is Goldman Singapore, but also the international subsidiary which is Goldman US, which is known as the market risk. Lot of times in the business schools, in the financial institution, the knowledge of the market risk in by banks are extremely limited. And this knowledge is at that level that sometimes you feel sad that I'm talking to a banker who realistically do not, holistically and realistically do not understand how this works, to be honest. So what happened? This is for the working capital requirement we wrote here. It is for a working capital requirement for telecom operation amounting 10 billion in the next 10 years. Do we have the pricing risk? Of course, we have the pricing risk. Singtel is facing the pricing risk. There is no doubt about that. Singtel is not facing the pricing risk. There are many intelligent people, those who come to me and say that, Rahul, what would? What would if the SPLC is in sing dollar terms, then would the would, uh, Singtel having the pricing risk? Yes. Then the, then the pricing would be the credit risk. Market risk is a bucket. It is a bucket. So example, just assume you go to the shopping mall and in the shopping mall you have this trolley, right? In which you are putting everything, your oil, your shampoo, your water, your Coca-Cola, your Pepsi, whatever you the, the, the your utilization in a home, you are putting everything. It now, now nobody has said that in this trolley, you, you, nowhere it is written that in this trolley, you cannot put the Pepsi. I wanted to have only one Pepsi, I wanted to have the trolley. What's wrong boss? There's nothing wrong. Or somebody will say, boss, I wanted to buy everything here. I wanted to buy a t-shirt, jeans, belts, shampoo, whatever, whatever. I need a big trolley. Similarly, market risk is a bucket. Now, in this market risk, there are many components. Interest rate is a component, CDS is a component, pricing is a component, cash flow is a component, fair value is a component. There are multiple components. But thank you to the books which are being written in the globe. Thank you to the few good people like Investopedia and Wikipedia. For them, market risk is the most simplest risk we have in the globe. But fortunately, Fortunately, the Reuters and Bloomberg are the two basic pillars of the globe. According to me, in the FX market, those who understand what market risk is all about. Let's move further. Is that is subject to pricing risk, which is a part of market risk? Yes, it is. It have IR risk, interest rate risk. It have FX risk, cash flow risk, dollar to sing dollar. It have the CDS risk, yes. So, since we are dealing with this currency, dollar to sing dollar, it have the cash flow risk, it have the fair value risk. At the same time, since it is LIBOR plus, sorry my mistake, dollar LIBOR plus 100 basis point, it have the IR risk as well. To make the thing little simplistically, we are assuming that the CDS risk is ignored by corporates. And actually it's not simplistically, this is a realistic situation also. You know, I worked in Treasury for 10 years and I have never seen that any company in our professional uh, fraternity that any company is really interested in hedging the credit risk. In most of the times, majority of the Treasuries are acting as a cost center and Treasuries are really not interested to learn anything new. Neither the bosses of the treasury are interested to give any new information to their kids. They are thinking, why should we give that? And this is one of the reasons why we are failing, why the level, the knowledge level of the treasuries are falling at a very substantial pace. To make the things more difficult, what happened that with every standby bank guarantee, standby BG or any kind of trade finance facility, there is a sanction letter. And that sanction letter, most of the times, 
I am wrong here, 99.99% of the time, to correct myself, 99.99% of the time is clearly mentioning that the exposure, if any, which includes IR, interest rate, FX and CDS has to be covered by the same bank. You are not, I will put this in a different way, you are not entitled to hedge this exposure from any another bank. Since the line being sanctioned by Goldman, you are not entitled to hedge this except Goldman and in most of the times this scenario is there. Had it been we taken the case of HSBC here and HSBC here, the hedging would have been done with HSBC. Had it been say Chase, the hedging would have been done by Chase. These big people never allow hedging to be done by somebody else. That is one of the most important reasons in the interbank and the trade finance market. So there are cases so here, Signal Singapore, you can see the arrow since the pricing risk is there. There are two types of pricing risk which we have. One kind of pricing risk is the IR risk, FS risk and the CDS risk which they are hedging. But in CDS, for the sake of simplicity, we assume they are not hedging. One which they do not hedge is the credit line risk. Most of the banks, financial institutions, hedge funds, DFIs, endowments, pension funds, they never give the knowledge in the public domain that how to hedge the credit line risk. And I'm sorry, we are also not letting you know that how to hedge the credit line risk as it is a very technical and the time consuming topic. That's it. Now hedging of cash flow and the fair value has to be done via Goldman Singapore and assuming they are hedging from their Marina 1 office, our office is also at Marina 1. So hedging cash flow plus fair value from Goldman, they are hedging from their Marina 1 office. Goldman Singapore is covering this in the interbank market and assuming they have three partners because there are three risks, right? Three partners, FX is they are covering with DBS, UOB, OCBC, three top local banks. IR is they are covering with DBS, Bank of America. CDA is they are taking from Chase London. Now there are many people, those who often come to me say that Rahul, why Chase is selling the CDS and why they, why they though they know that central financial position is not in good terms. I wanted to ask one thing that, let me answer this, that why we have insurance companies in cars, automobile, home, factories, everything. Isn't the car company know that things are things can be messed up? Isn't the home company do not know things can be messed up? So anything can happen. Anything can happen. But it's a business, right? Now the question is that there are two parts to it. Since we are talking in Singapore context, the type is D part. Singtel is a Singaporean company. They are dividing their hedging into two parts. One, the contracts which they are taking in the deliverable market. It could be forward, it could be options, it could be swaps, FRA, OIS, anything. Or they are taking in the ND, non-deliverable market, which is Bank of America, BNP, in, in case of FX, in case of IR, it could be standard charted and DB. So I repeat, is Sintel taking having the pricing risk? Of course. Whom are they hedging? The Marina One office of the Goldman. Goldman is, since they are hedging into two parts, which is the deliverable part and the non-deliverable part. In the deliverable part, they are at the interbank part of the Goldman is DBS, UOB, OCBC. While the interbank IR part is the uh, interest rate partner would be DBS and Bank of America. In case of Chase Lend, in case of CDS, the partner is Chase Lender. In case of non-deliverable, it is Bank of America, BNP, while IR is Standard Chartered and the DBS. The problem becomes complicated now. The problem becomes complicated now. There are three cases which I am assuming. Simplistically three cases. In the real life, the cases are more than 100. Case number one, what would the complete 100%, which is $10 billion, would utilized? So commitment fee part is zero. What would, if the 50% lines being utilized, the commitment fees is 50%. 
So 50% is utilized on rest 50% we are going to apply the commitment fee. But what if the 25% of the notional is utilized while 75% we are going to have on the commitment fee. We can have multiple cases, the board is small and we cannot cover all the case in the interest of the time. The total is hedging of the market risk. Now the question is, Singtel is taking a rolling product. Singtel is not taking a fixed product. And Goldman is very well aware about this product and the practical problems associated with this product. I never disregard the fact that while giving the pricing to the Singtel, Goldman will not cover this in the pricing. Goldman will definitely cover this in the pricing. But at the same point of time, Goldman would always have market risk on their head. Goldman himself know that covering that in the pricing is not the only thing. The price market risk would always be on their head. And the problem becomes more complicated for Goldman that if in the first case it is 25%, so they are going to have that in the bank structure. All of a sudden, Singtel come and take another 25%. So let's assume that in the first year they have taken 25%. So 10 billion, 25%, 2.5 billion. Second year they come and take another 25%, which is 2.5 more. So the total is 5 billion. Third year they have paid 2 billion. So balance is 3 billion. And next year they come and say, give me the rest 7 billion. Goldman cannot say no because they have priced it. They are charging commitment fees from that. But the problem for the Goldman would come is that how to cover this in the interbank. Because every time when the Goldman will go in the interbank market, the pricing are changing. Due to federal policy, due to the Trump, due to the trade wars, due to the uh, elections in Singapore, due to the movement in the same dollars and there are a hell lot of reasons we have. That risk Goldman is having on their head is actually the market risk. And that market risk has to be divided into two parts. One is the banking book and one is the trading book. And when we talk in the context of the case which we have made, the scene for Goldman is like that. All the risk which Goldman is covering as far as the SPLC is concerned is the banking book. Because it's a banking business. Trade finance is a banking business. Debit card is a banking business. Credit card is a banking business. Bank guarantee is a banking business. Standby bank guarantee is a banking business. And all these are banking business. While, while the interbank position which Goldman is covering is actually the trading business. Actually the trading business. I have assumed the case that the Goldman has covered this case holistically. Goldman took the hedge holistically. But there the practical life have always been difficult than the theoretical life. I can, I can give you two cases right now. What would God forbid Singtel defaults? Singtel defaults. They do not want it to continue with their telecom operation and they are raising their hands. I am sorry, but I am winding up my business. Goldman would not be on the road. What Goldman would be on the crossroads? Then how would you segregate the market risk into the banking book and the trading book? The regulators, those who devise the fundamental review of the trading book are from the Eve League universities. Those who sits in the air conditioned room, walk in the air conditioned uh, vehicle and travel in business class. They do not know the practical problems of the banking. And if we have in this case, when, when we talk from a Goldman angle, this is the most simplistic case I am discussing. I am telling you. Goldman is dealing with 10 times tougher case than that. That doesn't mean that they are covering pricing risk holistically. Sometimes they keep it naked also. But this is very simplistically for Goldman. They cover 10 times difficult risk. But the biggest problem for the Goldman is that when the fundamental review of the trading book would be live, Boss, how would I segregate the banking risk and how would I segregate the trading risk? This problem has not yet addressed and rather than addressing this problem, the new draft of the fundamental review of the trading book is more messier than what it was. So the original draft of fundamental review of the trading book was okay, okay, but now it is more messier. And let me make the life more messier. 
I have six questions for everybody out and these six questions I'm going to be asking holistically from the regulators. Question number one. After this listing of this case, would it be easy for bank and the regulator to implement fundamental review of the trading book by 2022? 2019 is 50% over, 50% is pending. So practically they have two and a half years. While the draft which we have in the public domain is new is not resolving all the issues holistically. So considering these cases, do we still think that it would be easy for banks and the regulators to uh, have FRTB live by 2022 or do we need to look at the timing holistically or we need to look at the issues holistically. Is MA610 Monetary Authority of Singapore 610 basically the regulator of Singapore their draft which is uh, MS610 is, is a latest banking circular by, uh, by Monetary Authority of Singapore is it a pseudo FRTB which is going to implement October 2021 I think so but in this, even after that, actually, according to me, MA610 is the sum of two. And two things are, it is, it is uh, BCBS239, which is a banking committee of, uh, oh sorry, uh, banking committee uh, uh, BCBS239. And uh, second is the, your uh, FRTB. It is the mix of both. Is MA ready to deal with that challenges? I don't know. How easy for the bank to hedge the trade finance credit line post FRTB? In this throughout this example, the only thing which we not discussed because it is subject to consultancy, which is this. How easy for the banks to hedge the credit line in the interbank market post FRTB? Hedging of the credit line in the interbank market is today a challenge even when there is no FRTB. But after FRTB, the life would be worse. Do we still think that it would be easy for the banks to have that limit in place after FRTB or the trade finance would be at the crossroads after FRTB? We need to answer that question. My fourth question, very important. How, sorry, would market risk be market risk by 2022? Today, the definition of the market risk is clearly understood only by the top 15 banks of the globe, which covers Goldman, Standard Chartered, GS, UBS, Barclays, HSBC, uh, DBS, UOB, OCBC, ANZ, Westpac, and top. And I'm damn sure that there are many banks, and when we talk about the Indian context, they even do not holistically know that what is exact market risk. But the biggest question is not that whether you are aware or not. The biggest question is that would by 2022 market risk be market risk or it would be something else. I don't know the answer. But I know one thing that by 2022 when the treasury consulting front office architecture would be ready, market risk would be different. Let's see. My second last question, how many electric solutions are even closer to this issue? And the most unfortunate part is that even the beloved countries of mine, which is Australia and Singapore, there are many Rectech solution and the Rectech meaning is only almost same in both the countries, which is KYC, uh, verification of the CVs and checking of the frauds. And this is pretty sad. This is exemplary sad that if the Rectech meaning is left only KYC, CV screening and all these frauds. This is Rectech. Do we have one Rectech who is able to resolve this issue? There is one Rectech which is coming soon. You know the name of the company. How many B schools are teaching this? This question I am raising every time. How many business schools? IIM, Indian Institute of Management, IIT, MDI. Harvard, Stanford, Kellogg, SMU, NTU, Nanyang, and so many universities. How many of so-called, so-called wealth management courses, MBA courses, this, that, that, is actually raising the awareness in the kids 
those who are spending thousands and thousands of dollars on these issues. And last but not the least, Tennessee Consulting would like to thank you very much with two good news on the cards. Number one good news is that we have launched the Monitval. Monitval is our own name. It's going to be the world first IFIS enabled business valuation desk that would be covering soon. And that would be launching somewhere in quarter two of 2020, not far from now. And uh, the third phase development of the fixed income dot global is on the way. And the last good news from our site is that commodities desk, full fledged or uh, agriculture commodities desk is 30 days from now, three zero. So after 30 days, the full fledged commodity desk would be on the cards. With this, Treasury Consulting would like to thank you very, thank you very much, and we would like to assure you that we continue to raise aware awareness on these issues. We do not mind that what people think about us, but we hate those people, those who copy our YouTube videos on their channels. And if by 1st July 2019, my videos and the my content, or even if you copy my content on your, your video, is not get deleted, you do not know what would happen to you. I can reach to any level in the law, as per the law. And we request the cancellation of everything which you own. With this, Treasury Consulting, thank you very much. You know my mobile number, 919-8-992-42978. 919-8-992-42978. You know our fixed income platform, www.fixedincome.global www.fixedincome.global. With this, we thank you very much and more videos on the way. Have a good time. Thank you.